tonight's talk is in regards to Samson. This is part two of a two-part series. The title being The Fall and Rise of God's Judge. Samson, The Fall and Rise of God's Judge. We take our text from Judges chapter 16. Up till now, Samson has been conquering. He's been going in our in our last in our last uh, sermon regarding Samson. We talked about how that he had been given great strength, and when the Spirit of God would come upon him, he was used by God to go after the enemy, which the enemy in this case was the Philistines, who had been were in occupying the land of Israel and were causing them grief. And so Samson was anointed by God, uh, commissioned by an angel, and uh, he was declared to be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. And he just, he needed to not eat, not eat, uh, touch dead things. He needed to not eat any or drink anything, wine, and he needed to not cut his hair, which these are all the the tenets of uh, being a Nazarite. Uh, having a Nazarite vow before the Lord, which Nazarite just meant that you were separated unto the Lord, and it was a special consecration. So in Judges chapter 16 now, we see him, he's a grown man, and in our last episode, he had tried to get married. The guy married his wife off to his best man, and it didn't suit him very well, and he ended up taking 300 foxes, setting their tails on fire with a torch, and setting them through the... Through the um, the crops of the Philistines, which made them very mad, they came after him, and he killed a thousand of them with a jawbone of a donkey, if you will recall. So now we find our 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 hero in in Judges chapter sixteen. It says, "Now Samson went down to Gaza, and he saw a harlot there." You know, sometimes right after a major victory, you've got to be very careful because it can be become a, a great time of defeat for you. David in 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 uh, the book of Samuel talked about David when kings went out to war. David stayed at the house, and he was out there hanging out on his roof, being a king, and he looked over and saw Bathsheba bathing. So right after a major conquering, it was a time when he had one of his greatest falls because that ended up he went drew her to him. He slept with her, they had a baby, and then he ended up trying to cover his tracks by killing Uriah's wife. He said, hey, let's just kill this guy, and then, hey, you know, we'll just say the baby was his and whatever. We'll, you know, It didn't work out well. But after that, so many bad things happened, even in his own family, but it was all instigated by this time that he fell, and there's re- repercussions to sin. So, so we see Samson now going down into Gaza. And Gaza, we had talked about before, was the capital of the Philistine territory. So what's Samson doing down there walking around in, in Philistine land? He's checking out and he sees uh, a lovely harlot there and she entices him and then he went into her. The Bible said he saw a harlot there and he went into her. You know that sin comes starts oftentimes with seeing. You'll see something, you're like, I'm just looking. Doesn't hurt to look. You how many times we've heard that? <laughs> looking tends to go in there. And if you read it, uh, this is ch- verse one, it says, Samson went to Gaza and he saw a harlot there, and then Anne went into her. Okay? So now they're starting to see Samson's kryptonite. It's the ladies. Remember how, Sam, how how whenever Superman, they'd put kryptonite on him and he was like the, the wicked witch going, I'm melting, I'm melting. He just became, we need to watch out. Our flesh is weak. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And when you walk into the enemy's territory and you start hanging out there and just checking things out, I'm not doing anything, I'm just, I'm just here, okay? 
that can be a dangerous place for a Christian. Tonight I'm talking to Christians because this whole thing, Samson, our hero, is a, we would say he was a Christian. He was representing Jehovah God. And what's he doing in the enemy camp is what we want to know. And it starts off going into a harlot, and that's not a good place to start, Anne. Okay? So, verse 2. And the Gazites, were, were, which got people from Gaza, were told, Samson has come here, and they surrounded the place, and they lay wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is daylight, we will kill him. Do you know the enemy is after you not to play with you? The enemy straight up wants to kill you. Okay? That's the end of it. The end of it, when Satan's end game is to kill you. It may start with a little this, a little that, but the end of the deal is he wants to bind you up and kill you. And we'll see how that works here. So Samson, verse 3, lay, lay low until midnight. Then he gets up, took, he grabs the doors of the gate of, of the city and the two gate posts, rips them out of the ground, bars and all, puts them on his shoulders and carries them out and across the way and up on top of the hill. Now, it looks like Samson's getting by with it because he is like, he didn't get me. Okay? He's toying with sin. And when you walk on the edge, and Christians have to be aware of this, especially in this day and age where we've got the the different Facebooks and things that that can be an enticement where there's not a lot of, uh, uh, how would you say? Uh, I'm sorry? No. Um, it's just, it's, it's a place where enticement can happen. Let's just say it that way. So, Verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorak. And this is a different woman whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies and by what means we may empower, overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So they're working with Delilah. He's got the hots for you. Here's what you need to do for us. And so they're working with her to entice him to find out why he's whipping up on him all the time. What's his strength? Why? Okay. So then he, we, start this, we start this series of three different deals where she, sa she says, Samson, tell me where your great strength lies, verse, verse 6, that, we may that you can be bound and afflicted. Why would anybody that loves you try to bind you and afflict you? See, she's, he's kind of enjoying this because it's kind of, he's, 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 he's toying with this thing. And, and the problem with all of that is when you toy with sin before it's over, it'll bite you. And he finds that out. Samson says, if you will bind me with seven fresh bowstrings not yet dried, then I'll become weak and like other men. So they bind him with seven fresh bowstrings. And the men that are in the that are laying wait in her little room jump out. She says, "The Philistines are upon you, Samson." And he breaks the bowstrings like yarn breaks when it touches fire. And so his secret was still not found. So here he is. He's still, Mister. I've got all this under, under control. So verse eleven. She says, you're mocking me and you've told me lies. Please tell me what you may be bound with. And then he, in verse 11, it says, so he said, bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used. Then I will become weak and just like any other man. So then she takes the new rope. She binds him and the Philistines. She says, Philistines are upon you. The men are lying, lying in wait in the room. And he broke them off of them just like thread. And she says again, you're, you're just messing with me. What is it? Where's the part of your strength? And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my hair into the, into the web of loom, 
then I'll be weak as water. And so she does that. And then she says, the Philistines are upon you. And he wakes up and pulls out the, the batten and the web of the loom. And she says, how can you say you love me when your, your heart is not with me? And it came to pass, verse 16, when she pestered him daily with her words and she pressed him. She just kept wearing him down, wearing him down, so that his soul was vexed to death. And verse 17 says that he told her all his heart. She wore him smooth out. He said to her, no razor has ever come upon my head. Do you know what I, what I got to see in all of this? Was that Samson's hair was a covenant that he had with God. And if, if the enemy could, can cut that hair, it can sever that relationship of us with our God. And through his toying with sin, he got so close to it and so wore out, he finally just said, fine, I'll just tell you what it is. And I put in my margin, he committed spiritual suicide. But that's the way when you keep messing with sin and messing with it and getting closer and closer and closer to that edge, before it's over, you'll be so wore out and you'll be, you'll, they'll find a day when your strength is not there to resist and you're toast. And we think in our mind, we think in our heart, oh, I'm strong enough, I would never do that. And yet that's, that's the enemy's tactic is to wear us down. He says, no razor has ever come upon my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God. I've been separated to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, if my hair is cut, then my strength will leave me. He knew exactly what his, what his, where his strength lie. His strength was in that hair. And it wasn't in the hair so much, but it was in the fact that he was in co covenant with God. Because whenever he'd get in a bind, the spirit would come upon him and where's the donkey jawbone and or rip, rip the uh, gates out of, their, out of the ground. But when, when the enemy cuts your hair, he's cut the covenant. And we'll see that in a moment because it says, if I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me and I'll become weak like any other man. And when Delilah saw that she, he had told her all his heart, she told the lords of the Philistines, come up at once, for he has told me all his heart. So they came. They brought her the money. She lured him to sleep on her knees. She called for the man, and he shaved off all the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Upon you. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times. See, he's still, he's still depending upon his flesh. I've got this. And I'll shake myself free of these, of these uh, bond, bonds. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Lord departed from him when they cut his hair. So God was, God just walked away and said, fine, and left him to his, to, to, to fight it out himself in his own strength. Verse 21, then the Philistines took him now they've conquered him. They put out his eyes. They, they, they gouged his eyes out and made him blind. They brought him down to Gaza. Now he's a prisoner. They bound him with fetters. Now he's chained like a common prisoner. And he became a grinder in the prison. He became their servant. This is what 
Satan ultimately wants to do with us. He wants us to become his servant. He wants to bind us. He wants to... And he does it through enticement, through allurement, through um, trickery. He became a grinder in the prison. And listen to verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after he had been shaven. Do you know that after you've fallen and after you've you hit your nose on the, on the floor and skidded for 12 paces and it's just destruction... God can still restore you. Your hair can begin to grow again. And what that means to me is when your hair begins to grow again, when he lost his hair, he lost his power. When he lost his hair, he lost his communion with God. God left the building and he was all by himself, chained and, and grinding grain in their, in their prison. But when his hair began to grow again, to me it was like, Tomorrow's a new day. What are we going to do tomorrow? Now, he doesn't have any eyes, okay? And he's still chained. But we see, it's kind of like we see that little shoot coming up, first the blade, then the ear, okay? This is Samson's second chance, okay? They were, re they were rejoicing over him because they had conquered him. We've got him bound. He's in the prison. He's grinding we're in charge, he's, he's nothing, he's, we used to be scared of him, now we're not looking at him over there, he's blind, he's stumbling around, okay, but God always has the last laugh, and even when you're down, even when you've done just about the unpardonable, God is still able to restore, and you say, however, the hair began to grow again. And the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer sacrifices to Dagon, their god. This is the same Dagon that several chapters later or several, I don't know how long it would be later, but whenever the Ark of the Covenant was out and about, and it had gone on the Ark's carts, and there's a story about it, being lost and then here it comes floating home when it when they said let's 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 go put it in the temple of Dagon our God this is the same Dagon that they're cheering and saying Dagon whip Samson okay but that's several stories later but this is the same Dagon that when they came to the temple in the morning they found the god Dagon fell over on the on the uh, ground with it I think his arms were broken off I mean God toppled their God, even though and it was just with his, with his Ark of Covenant in their temple. So this is, this is their same God that, that they're rejoicing in. They gathered together to offer great sacrifice to, to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. And they said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. So they're saying our, Dagon is the one that is whipping up on Samson. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, our God has delivered our, our enemy into our hands. The destroyer of our lands, the one who multiplied our dead. They said, he killed so many people, now he's, now he's on our side. We're going to wear him out. So it happened, this is verse 25. So it happened when their hearts were married that they said, Call for Samson that he may perform for us. So they're given sport. When their hearts were merry, so they were drinking, their hearts were getting merrier and merrier, and they were thinking less and less and getting more and more cocky with Samson. <laughs> they were not being careful with him. Uh, and I put, and his new head of hair. They were overconfident, they overstep, and they'll pay for it. So they called Samson from out of the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between 
two pillars. This would be this. They would look back on this and say, you know, that was not a good idea. Never let Samson lean on your pillars. That that right there would be a bumper sticker. Okay. They call for Samson from the prison. He performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. The pillars. The two. Then Samson said to the lad who was holding him by the hand, remember he's blind, let me feel the pillars that support the temple so that I can lean on them. Verse 27, now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof watching while Samson performed. They were in tall cotton. They thought, this is the deal. We're watching Samson and how cool is that? And Samson's going. Judges 16, verse 28 says, Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray. Just this once. He said, God, all I need is one more good push. Just this once, O God, so that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes that they gouged out. Verse 29, And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the weight of the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And you know, we're real hard on Samson. But you know right here, He wasn't worried about his life. He was there on a mission. God had said he would destroy the enemy through Samson. And here he is at the end of his days, actually the last day of his, of his tenure. And he says, God, one more time, let's kick some butt. And that's not in your King James. Okay, so... He said, let me die. Listen to this. Listen listen to this. Let me die with the Philistines. You know, the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for for his friends. Okay. This is his heart. God, if I got to be blind, if I got to, if I got to be chained up like an animal, one more time, give me strength and let's, let's tear it up. Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And my margin says, and his growing hair. <laughs> I love that hair part. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. Listen to this. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed during his life. Okay, now, Samson went through a lot. He hit the bottom a lot. But God, as his hair grew again, God gave him that strength. And he was able to... to to finish his assignment and to finish well, okay? And we say, how do we know he finished well? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 says, Hebrews incidentally is the hall of faith. It'd be like being in the Grand Old Opry or being in the, okay, 
if you're in there on the wall, you've arrived, honey. Okay, so what will I more say? This is Hebrews 11, 32 through 34. What will I more say? For the time would fail me. And they're, and they're listing out Abraham and Noah and how they, through faith, did this and through faith. And then at the end, he goes, you know what? There's a gazillion faithful people of God. And he just starts naming them off. He doesn't even go into it. He says, he says, time would, f-. he said, I don't have enough time to tell you all about Gideon. Remember Gideon with the sword of the Lord and of Gideon breaks the deal. And here's the, and they routed with 300, however many thousand Midianites. Time would fail me to tell of, of to tell of Gideon, to tell of Barak. Barak, wasn't that uh, Deborah's? Okay, Deborah's sidekick, and with Deborah's help, they went and, and subdued kingdoms. I mean, they, they had great victory. So you've got Gideon, he says, and then there's Barak. And he said, and Samson. Don't forget about Samson and his lovely locks of new hair. And Jephthah, and also David. There's David, just a one-liner. Don't forget about David, the great-great-great-granddad of Jesus. And Samuel. The, and the prophets who, listen to this, who through faith. So he's got Samson and he, sa- and he says, by the way, Samson through faith subdued kingdoms. He worked righteousness. He obtained promises. He stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, he was made strong. He became valiant in battle. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. This is all done by faith. So you can see faith is like a blank check. Whatever you need, I can write the check. God can write the check for you. Through faith, you can subdue kingdoms, you know, and it goes on. The women raised, received their dead raised to life again. And it just, it, if you read Hebrews, it's, it's, it's a good read. But, the point being that Samson was right smack in the middle of all this, and God said he was one of my judges. And he subdued kingdoms out of weakness. He was made strong. So even though he, he fell, yet God restored him. And in his, in his final push he conquered he, he conquered more of the enemy than he had this whole life Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 6. And this talks about, this talks again about, about sin. And we saw how sin affected Samson in his life. And I think we need to take a heads up in ours. Sam, uh, Proverbs chapter 7 verse 6. For at the window of my house, Solomon said, I looked through my lattice. He's looking out of his doors and he through out of his window. And he sees among the simple, I perceived among the youths, a young man devoid of understanding. So here you got this young kid. It's just clueless. He's just out there going, just looking around. So he's watching this kid. A young man devoid of understanding. Verse 8, passing along the street near her corner. Okay. Remember we talked about initially that, that Samson's, Samson's trouble started when he started going down into the enemy camp and getting near her corner. And he took the path to her house. So it starts out near her corner. Before it's over, he's in her house. Okay, you see this progression here? In the twilight, in the evening, in the black 
and dark of night. A lot of times the, the evil and the things we need to watch out for happen in darkness. Okay, they happen when we're concealed, happen when we're off, off the clock, so to speak. So these are times when we need to be careful is the point. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black of night, verse 9. And there a woman met him, this young, this young, clueless, we'll call him the clueless young man. And, and by the way, let's not be the clueless young man, okay? And there the woman met him with an attire of an harlot and a crafty heart. She's loud and rebellious. Her feet do not stay at home. At times she's outside and at times in the open square. This girl's going anywhere to start trouble and, and um, it's not good. She's lurking at every corner. So she caught him. She catches this, this young man and she kisses him with an impudent face. She says to him, I have peace offerings with me. Today I have paid my vows. So I came out to meet you diligently to seek your face and I have found you. So she's been looking for him. I have spread my bed with tapestry, colored coverings of Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us drink, delight ourselves with love. So this is, she's just talking, she's trying to seduce him. She's trying to um, lure him. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and won't, and will come home on an appointed day. With her enticing speech, she caused him to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduced him. Okay, now let's look at the change in the young man. Immediately, verse 22, he went after her like an ox going to the slaughter. as a fool to the correction of the stocks till an arrow struck his liver as a bird is hastening towards a snare that's going to catch it. He did not know it would cost him his life. Verse 24. Now, therefore, here's, here's the, this is Solomon talking. Listen to me, my children, pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't be tempted by her. Do not stray into her path. For she has cast down many wounded. This isn't, this isn't anything new. Her, she has cast down many wounded. And all who were slain by her were strong men. Her house is the way to hell descending to the chambers of death. So that's, that's just a, that's a, that's a warning and a heads up that when we, you know, the Bible says uh, heart when is full, then sin when is full grown brings forth death. It starts out with the temptation and then it becomes this and when it's all over, it's death. That is the ultimate end of enticement and seduction and temptation is to kill you. It's not to, okay? And like Samson, if we keep toying with it and seeing how much closer we get to the edge before it's over, we won't have any strength to leave. And I think that's how, it's like the little bo- frog in the water. It's getting boiled and before it's over, it's over, okay? So we need to take a clue from Joseph, when Potiphar's wife hit on him, and he took off and ran. He didn't stay there and talk about it, and let's discuss this. To the point that he left his stuff there and he was gone. But he wasn't there. Okay? So, Samson, the fall and rising again of God's judge. Amen.